All right, here we go. What's up, Giga Gamers? We've got the matchup of the week, probably of the season, definitely of the split. The rebound, is Cloud9 going to be able to bounce back? Uh, we've seen some wild miscalculations from them. Probably, we, ha we have our um, ideas where those are coming from, our, our speculations where they're coming from. I think, I think having a new member on your team adds a new dynamic and... Uh, Jojo has shown in the past that that he thinks that he's something else, right? And and I don't know that he is accurately assessing how good he is. He's a very good player. His ceiling is higher than any other ceiling. Uh, it, it's the highest talent cap that we've ever seen in this region. But it seems like, like I said, um, when they qualified for MSI the first time around with EG that it happened too soon, that this young team of young, of young rookies needed some time to really come together and learn the steps. And because they won that first playoffs, they got to go to MSI, and suddenly they're just thinking they're the best team, they're God's gift to, to the LCS, and they stop wanting to improve. Danny implodes, and JoJo it just does it in-game with style. Uh, and and it becomes an issue and we're going to see if they can work past that the talent on this team is insane but so is the talent on FlyQuest Jensen's getting up there in in age but Busio has previously been an MVP of the Academy League uh, Inspired has been an MVP in two leagues Bwipo is an insanely talented player and one of the smartest guys that has ever played the game so I do expect them to have a something to say about Cloud9's romp here. FlyQuest does have the momentum in their in their side, being seven and two already. But JoJo, I think, and Cloud9 in general are going to be able to carry this uh, if they if they want, right? And they really have to dedicate themselves to that narrative to say, "I want to dominate this thing." Uh, very interesting new setting here to make it look like a cage match. What do you guys think? Hashtag strat chat. Is this, is this good for the game? Uh, I believe that this is in preparation to defend against the DDoS attacks because LCK has been getting ruined. I don't know uh, everything behind it. You know, they can say publicly what they want, but what do you guys think of the cage match ideal right here? It looks kind of, I don't know. It, it seems pretty sweet, but it seems like it's good for the movies. Obviously, you can't have fans there, which is kind of tough. Whippo, best top laner in the league, inspired. Uh, really, the, the rest of, of the roster, you could say top three or top five at, at their positions. And it'll be interesting to come down and, and looking at the draft and what we're going to get out of it. I really want to see some synergies that allow Blabber and JoJo to work together. The problem is that previously, it's always been about Blabber coming up with a good game plan with a high tempo jungle clear and synergizing with his mid lane. Jojo doesn't play that way, right? Jojo plays to dominate by himself. He likes to call out two and a half minutes into the game. It's over. GG, I'm crushing this guy like he did on that Gragas game. And to be fair, he did. You know, that was after the week start, after supposed, you know, supposing that he was the best player in the league. And then people are like, what happened to Jojo? He goes, all right, I'll show you, right? And it looked like a robot was playing. It was insanely, insanely talented. Uh, the precision on the clicks was premium just absolutely pinnacle level uh league of legends but is that the guy that shows up every single game right it seems like sometimes we get the jokester sometimes we get the styler the memer you know i i want the cutthroat player and i want you know you only get a certain amount of opportunities to do it 14 per season 14 games over three months to prove that you're the best player and Thinking you're the best player and even knowing you're the best player is different than showing that you're the best player. And you need to come out with the mentality that you want to dominate. So that's what I'm looking for from Cloud9. I want JoJo to absolutely dominate. Blabber's cap capable of doing it. JoJo is capable of doing it. Are they capable of doing it together is the big question. If a team is, is battling inwards, that's a problem, right? And it can make the other people around it, even if you're not the ones not jiving, it can make other people feel it, right? That's why positive culture needs to precede positive results. And yeah, you can bring superstars together and you can take a roster and saying, hey, we're the best roster and we're going to level up at, in the mid lane and get even stronger. But if the personality doesn't fit, 
then you can actually sever the synergy that the team had. And you don't always need the five very best players. All-star teams often lose to other teams, right? Um, fa famously, you know, going back decades now, but the Russian national team for the Olympics would crush the NHL All-Stars, crush them. And it's because they worked as a unit. They were all as good or almost as good, but they worked as a team. And that synergy, right, is what matters the most. There was a lot of discussion this week on the role of coaches and what they should be doing, and it was a topic on, on the dive. The role of the coach is to take each of the five members on, of the team and help them to be better than they could be on their own, and then to take the team and make it stronger than five individuals. What's stronger, this or this, right? When you have a cultural issue, which I suspect Cloud9 is having, then it's like having broken fingers and you just don't, you can't make the fist. Your team doesn't want to come together. So that's why I'm looking from them to try to make highly synergized plays. I want them to do things together. I would even let them int games just to recapture the passion for making plays together to move as one and and do that so i don't mind if i see four people diving bot just for the sake of diving bot i don't care if it's mathematically right and you give up two waves and two plates mid and top just to get the team back together all right here we go the early invade path no one brought sweeper no we did bring sweeper from ash using it now they're kind of spot this out they're trying to spread out the gold make sure that they get it to the right players they're going to get a, ra a ward over here to try to trick uh try to set up for a raptor camp now they're playing strong on bot side right they're a little bit too late for recalls right now so it's an interesting spot from whippo it's like he's staying here long enough to ensure the play but he actually hasn't left yet so does that mean that he's teleporting no he's going back now this will seed the lane pressure to a renekton uh, which is not something that you always have to do but you're knowing that since you didn't see anyone and you know that they saw you because of the wards you know that nidalee you can infer that nidalee's in the northern quadrant Therefore, as an Aatrox, you have no business fighting for lane prio, right? So the Aatrox knows it's okay to show up late here because there's nothing else to do. Now, if you're Renekton, you should grab the wave, pull it into the bush, and let it come back, right? And then stack it against yourself. Have the wave come back to you and not even fight for the prio. Because if you do that, then it forces the Aatrox away from his own turret, and then you can get Nidalee to come in for a gank. Maokai with good coverage here ends up with the Raptors. He's going to go uh, presumably for a full bottom side clear, and maybe they're going to try to stack a wave. Yeah, it looks like they're trying to stack a wave. The minion wave, they pulled it over to themselves here, and it looks like they're going to go in for a dive. So uh, this is really good setup right now. When you, Whenever you have this uh, full quadrant control, you can look to take all three camps and then stack bot wave and dive with uh, two level twos and a level three versus two level ones. But it looks like Maokai is actually pulling out a little bit of the motion backwards from Senna and Nautilus is enough to dissuade uh, Maokai and he leaves, which means that he's actually a full camp behind. Also, we see the Hawk shot right here. Ash is going to use that right uh, actually at level two. They're not afraid of the wave right now because they get the harass from the W. They don't value the extra points in the Q. So they want to confirm how much did Nidalee take. And by getting information on that, they'll see that she's taken all three of these. That means she's going to path here. And that means that she's going to come out level four with six camps and fight for that topside scuttle. That means Maokai basically has to come for this and then come back for the Raptor respawn. We'll see if there is any amount of exploitation done. Uh, Renekton has put the wave into the turret, which means that they took the minimum in the top lane. They, they took a slight lead on Renekton as their prize. And they say, no, we're going to value... Nidalee actually getting out onto the map. Uh, Nidalee in an incredibly strong state right here. Consecutive bust to the champion. Uh, the last one I don't think was needed at all. And it was meant to try to... It's part of the... What's the word I'm looking for? Part of the plan, the course of action to try to make her more understandable for the masses. Because there's a huge talent discrepancy on this champion. Even on just the clear. She probably has the most mechanical mechanically intensive clear of all junglers but um 
Yeah, it, may, it means that she's going to be insanely strong and pro. Now, interesting here from Maokai. Maokai does not decide to fight for the second spawn of the Raptors. Says that they're giving up Pryo. Azir's got the push in mid. And Varys and Ash are trying to pull this back to them because Maokai's going to the other side. But he doesn't realize that Nidalee did not start Raptors. Right? She took Raptors third. So they exploited this bot side play by going one, two, three which means that they took the raptors about 35 seconds later than they normally would so instead of spawning at that like 355 mark they're actually going to be spawning at 430 maybe even later here i didn't see exactly what time she finished it but they you can see that they're still not up on the map the krugs are up maokai can now figure out and he can piece together the puzzle that now that krugs are down that means that the raptors are coming up and here they are 450 for the respawn so inspired is actually getting very little out of this path and it feels like they've actually gotten the least hold on jojo trying to be aggressive on Jens jensen this is what we want to see from him styling in the 1v1s outplaying these guys just playing at a whole nother level he is definitely capable of it his mid lane prios can allow nidalee to roam around the map and that's exactly what you want as a nidalee you see jungler only taking the first camp. There's multiple reasons for that. Number one is it does not alert the enemy team that you've done it. Second is it counts for the jungle item. So you're going to get full value for the extra golden experience. And third smaller reason, it the shields will wear off of the camp, right? So they'll come back. You'll be able to come back to it. You can take it later. You can take a second one and then leave. Uh, you can do whatever pattern you wish. But taking the first one is the really important bit. Uh, another benefit of taking the first grubs is that you ensure that it's only going to be a 1-5 split even if you never go again, right? The sixth grub spawns two extra grublings when you're attacking turrets. The fifth one on top of the five stacks gives you one extra grub and four gives you none, right? So if you can take the first spawn of the grublings each time it comes up, then that ensures a 2-4 split at the maximum for your opponents which means that you're happy you got two they don't get the extra void mites they don't get the extra pushing power they just have a little bit extra but you're the one who's get coming in there for the extra benefits with the jungle item etc also smaller thing also you control the respawn time so there are many many reasons to take one out of three voids Something's wrong with that visual. I don't know if it was on my, just my screen, but you guys can let me know. Hopefully, we hopefully that doesn't get in the way of the content. So topside pressure is seated. They're going to give that away. Aatrox is going to play weak side versus this Renekton, which means Renekton will be able to take this matchup to the maximum. He'll be stronger than Aatrox at basically every level in the one v one. Aatrox will start taking this over at about level nine. Uh, and then once you get to the unlocked extra passive hits. Ash Varus, tons of poke. Uh, the Senna Nautilus, which is a lane that we've seen tons together. Uh, just a very natural pairing, especially when you have a farming Nautilus, right? You have a fasting Senna and a feasting Nautilus. Hold on, Jensen taking it to Jojo. Nice trading. But you see that we have the world atlas from senna now this is something that can actually be improved on honestly starting with these two items not as good as starting with doran's blade and doran's shield the senna will will very naturally get some amount of last hits you can give her some you can take the cannons she can take the casters while the nautilus can leave it because he doesn't want to get poked by the varus ash you can trade some of the farm and then first back you can go back and get your world atlas and then you just have an insanely strong doran's item we saw this in lck for those of you i know you guys are shaking your heads and you're like what is he talking about uh t1 did it that's all i need to say right you heard it here first so if you guys uh haven't yet make sure you subscribe like the like the video if you're enjoying the content so far but definitely subscribe so you can get the meta breaking strategies like double Dorans to start the game uh, and turn on those notifications so you can see when we're live we're going to try to do this much much more often you guys have spoken the advanced coaching and the game reviews that's what you want so that's what, what we're going to get if there's another element something that you like in the channel let me know 
the comments. All right, you see right here, this is a little bit off off uh, script. Inspired trying to make a play on this side. Now they do bait and they're actually able to get enough with the long distance ash arrow is what they're able to play. So a little bit of something from this bot lane, not only is it super aggressive in the bot lane, but both of these champions can play a supportive role in team fights, right? Both of them have ultimates that have crowd control abilities, which makes it very easy for an Aatrox to take over a game. Now, it is worth noting, so Karma deals the most damage that she's ever dealt, right? And you see these Malignant's builds. Uh, sometimes you see, I think, Horizon Focus from Faker. You see Cosmic Drive, at, uh, Cosmic Drive at times. So Karma is dealing the most damage that she has ever dealt as a champion, but she's still not the highest damage champion that, that you could ever have. And so there is a risk of having a little bit lower DPS, especially when it comes to burst. You're... You're expecting and you want fights to be dragged out so you can have the Ash stack up. You want the Varus to get multiple on hits. You want uh, multiple Mantra spells from from the Karma. Aatrox coming in and getting his passive proc a couple times, right? They want really long fights, but so do these two. So it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out. Now, more from the jungle right here. Uh, Blabber actually is spreading out the queue. It looks like he's going to go for all the grubs. See if that arrow goes and hits anyone on the far side. No, it looks like Maokai. They're happy to play more towards the bot side. Again, they're going to give up the top. You see how Maokai is going for Raptors. Almost definitely going to look at this side again, but with Ash, no ultimate. That's not really a play that they can make. Uh, what I would like to see is a little bit of mid to bot prio. Come in, help the Karma to push here, split the XP. After the jungle changes, uh, the, the Blabber special is, is no longer as overpowered as it used to be uh, for those of you guys who were fans about two years ago blabber started pathing through mid you just go through mid scuttle to scuttle over and over and you share some of the experience on the way there they have recently nerfed the amount of uh, experience that you get from sharing as a jungler and you don't have this hyper fast level six that you could get at 630 in games just by pathing through hold on we see the aggression here Sending getting the ult while she can. They're using the ultimate to let Nidalee set up. And this is really a uh, beautiful setup for them. Autolus, with all those extra stacks, is going to feel impervious, right? And especially versus this double AD, I love the plate mail pickup. All signs pointing to, to Cloud9 having a good game. They did have that one little fumble in the top side. But if it weren't for an, an errant enchanted crystal arrow from Busio coming through, you know, all the way from base right here. If it weren't for that, they'd be crushing this game, absolutely dominating. And they really, there is no strong point. Uh, I guess you could argue that Bwipo, the fact that he was weak side and, and he's within 20 CS is actually fairly remarkable. So, you know, kind of a testament to what we were talking about, about in the beginning. This guy looked like he was ready to go. This guy looked like he was ready for a nap. So I don't know, we'll see if that rears its head later. Later in the game. Going into the mid game, all right, we're approaching the end of laning phase. <clears throat> Ash and Varus, again with their long range and their supportive ultimates, should have a lot of team fight pressure. And they are, this is a team comp that is going to spike right now, right? Because Karma is exceptionally strong. Aatrox is taking over in the Renekton matchup, so he's going to be great. Karma is going to be at her strongest relative to the Azir. Hold on, we see an all in. Why is the screen going crazy though? Sorry about that, guys. That, that is not me. Nice little flash. Good little outplay there. Bringing the extra the extra player into town. Italy coming to secure the kill. <clears throat> Bwipo doing everything to try to get it back. And this is with a wave, so you are going to lose a lot here. This is six grubs as well, which means that you're getting tons and tons of extra pressure on this turret. Not only that, but the wave being wiped underneath. Jensen taking these aggressive trades, showing that they are playing at the full value of the of the matchup, but unaware that the Nidalee is nearby. And that's something that you really should be. You just saw Nidalee on the top side. I like the concept of going for aggressive trades in this window against the Azir, but you can't really do it with the knowledge of what you just saw happen, right? Renekton just pushed, and you're assuming the recall. Nidalee just left into the jungle. Where do you think the Nidalee's at, right? Ready, ready to come for a play. And, and this is certainly a great usage 
a great opportunity to use an Azir ultimate in the early game, right? You're a playmaker. Level 6 and level 11 ults, right? Level 6, you can set up your own plays. Level 11, you can go and set up plays for other, for other people. Starting level 16, yes, if you find the right window for either of these two types, it'll be okay. But largely, you're using that last level of the ultimate to reposition a fight so that you can just zone better for your whole team. For example, setting up a wall for these guys. You push this wall forward and you just bracket out a Maokai Aatrox and allow your team to play front to back especially if you're setting up for a Renekton. Now, other things going for Cloud9, not only are they in the gold lead right now, but you're going to have the infinite scaling of Senna. Uh, she's looking for 80 stacks to feel really strong. 100 is when she's going to outrange here, and 120 is where she just takes over the game, and no one's going to be able to match her. That is not something you can do on the carry build, but because you're the support, you're going to get those extra stacks. Uh, it's she's at 45 right now so on a decent clip not the best but doing decent very hard in this matchup you don't get the free the free clips of a melee versus melee matchup but other strengths right senna going going crazy azir's outscaling already strong the fact that they have an extra 20 percent of economy coming from the bot lane is a big deal as well right the fact that you're able to farm on nautilus and Nautilus is doing all right. They have given some of the farm to the Senna. Senna is sharing some amount of it. But uh, yeah, this can be tough. We'll see if we end up getting a second support item here. This is not something that has caught on yet. I do anticipate it at some point to make it in. I love this build path too by the Nautilus. You see this? Double Ruby Crystal Plate Mail. And you can take that and move towards the Randuin's path. But assuming that neither of these champions is actually going to build crit, you can kind of prepare for that build if they decide to go for it. They're probably not going to, but you're prepared. But also just saying, I, will, I like plate mail. That's great. But I also need the health to go along with the armor to get the maximum amount of synergy for it. Double ru ruby crystal is one of the best ways to get early advantage in the game. They decide not to ride Shelly. Uh, something that has come out, right? The Shelly is always going to pop you out right here. And that leaves you very susceptible to something like a Varisol, right? The fact that you can't redirect the way that you're going to come out means that it's very easy for someone to hit a long range skill shot like Varisol, like Ashel, onto you, and they could just engage. Now, if you're the right type of team for it, you might just want that. You want, might want to pick that fight. But in this game where they're happy to scale and to scale, they're going to be incredibly happy to play this game and take it slowly, right? Nidalee doesn't mind a very snail-paced game where people have fewer resources than normal because it allows her to get in their face for longer, right? You could just get to play longer. You don't necessarily want everything to blow up. You want to be able to throw extra spears. You want to be able to get extra heals out. And you want to be able to find synergies with something like Nautilus right here. So Nautilus actually using his Q in response to the Varus ultimate. So you get no value from that. And FlyQuest, uh, I don't know if they know what, what they have left to fight for. Budge's last E sort of surprised FlyQuest right there. Does he think he can take this? He's engaging. This is bizarre. He did not need to go back in there, but he decides to take it. He's got Senna ult and he's actually going to win this. There's no way he wins it. But he does get extra resources down. Now that is Senna ult being used. That was Renekton ult as well. They have teleport. They're probably not going to lose that much. Aatrox is feeling incredibly strong at this point, but without the completed items yet, might not try to get into the into these fights. Hold on. Jojo, all right. We said that Jojo wants to style on people. That's a hit. Gets his style points off. And his team actually still is able to get the dragon as well. Okay. So they don't give up anything in return. Nice little, nice little uh, split call there. Realizing that they could do that. It was on a control ward. So Whippo should have had the vision. Should have seen that it was coming. Uh, perhaps thought that they had exactly enough time to get out. But they do get poked. Get taken out. And that play is mostly available because the flash is gone, right? So the flash was used to secure the kill on the Renekton. If you don't do that, you you may not hit your level two ultimate 
right? Aatrox can flash over it, and if that happens, then you're potentially in, in really uh, deep problems as the Azir. Because Aatrox is just going to be playing with so many of their cooldowns back up. We see the Profane Hydra build. This is just like stat stick, one of the best... One of the best uh, bundles of stats that you can get and, and an insanely strong active for burst damage. A little bit of miscommunication there. Maybe could have continued to bait. Whippo could have taken that fight a little bit longer with the Ash right there with the Enchanted Crystal Arrow. But now that the ultimate's gone, it is going to be really tough for them to fight back. Uh, the window in this game where they were strongest is already well past them. So this game is in Cloud9's hands. We'll see whether or not they are able to... Uh, win cleanly, right? We've seen in the past that especially JoJo is just willing to take drastic, stylistic fights. And we want a player, right? So we're, we're often talking to coaches and we're talking to uh, managers who train coaches on this channel. And you don't want to lose the swagger and confidence of your player, but you want to make sure that it works within the synergy of your team. So yes, you want to embrace JoJo's confidence, but you want to make sure that it plays within the style of the team. And if everyone's working at the same level, you can play towards your best players and you can play towards their tendencies. So if the plan is, let's say Fudge wants to play back while JoJo wants to press, then that's where you get that discord, right? And that dissonance means that you might appear to be inting when all it really is is just miscommunication hey, I think that we can be really strong here. I'm, I'm expecting and anticipating for you to follow me up. And if that's not the unilateral call, then that's a little bit difficult, right? And for a team that's been accustomed to listening to a different player, Blabber, where Blabber says, hey, I can do this, and the whole team knows, it took a whole year for them to, to realize, like, okay, you know, he's our best player, and if he says it's possible, then we can make it happen. He sees it, let's just do it. And it's much better, again, to have five people working as one, even if even the weakest punch is going to be stronger than a slap, right? Five people kind of on different plans doing their own things, not going to be as powerful. You want these people together. And after this break, the goal, we spoke about it, it was, pri it was privately, I wish I could have mentioned it here, but Cloud9 need, needed that break. They needed a time to get together as a team and, and really have the same thing that happened to T1 last year, where Faker got hurt and the rest of the four went something like one in three while he was out injured. And they needed that moment to be like, yeah, like chill guys, you're not that good. You're, you're very good. You're very, very good, but you're not that good. You're not so good that you can't bring focus to the game, that you can't bring teamwork, that you can't bring synergy, these things that unlock that whole nother tier of competition and competitive prowess. You need the whole team working together. So this break was really the best thing that could have happened to Cloud9. We're, we're excited to see what they can do, just like the hype for this team was unreal going into the season. It should be that way after this game if they, can, if they continue to smoke FlyQuest. But it's, it's almost uh, nervous, anxious, anxiously awaiting the result here. It's like, are they going to do what they've done a lot of? And it's what JoJo did on EG. So, uh, sometimes he just has very loose deaths. And if that happens, what gives? All right, taking stock of the rest of the game. We got Umbral Glaive on Ash, uh, standard trying to keep track of the vision. Also with Zazax, a completely busted item. All the support items are insane, which is why you should try to get two of them in, onto your team whenever you can. Especially if you have a tank that can give up CS. Nice little flash from Busio. Jujo trying to go for a play. Inspire trying to peel the rest of the team, which means that they might try to isolate Jojo and go for the rest of this kill. Whippo trying to stave alive, but the karma is not enough. Nautilus does get into the fight. Beautifully done by Vulcan, and he gets the Q off into the back line. This is a... I mean, he just absolutely carried that fight. That was phenomenal. So good. I was very worried that after the flash over the wall that uh, Jojo was going to be in a tough spot, but that's exactly what I'm talking about. Everybody bought in right? Okay, you want to go for this flash play? We're in. We're going to back you up, right? I'm going to go in. I'm flashing that wall because I want to get in with the depth charge. I want to get every ability trained in together because if they don't, JoJo dies there, right? And that's the difference between week three Cloud9 and post-break, hopefully, hopefully.
And this is beautiful macro too. Jojo coming over to harass the dragon so that they don't even give up that prize. That is phenomenal by them. That is so, so good. They say, yep, these are the three people we need to come here. Uh, Azir can, can set up, use teleport, get into position. Now Renekton can be the big body. Welcome, uh, happy to zone people off. FlyQuest very much needs to just throw the punch. You know, take whatever punch you can. Try to get whatever vision you can, which is very, very difficult at this point. Uh, but try to throw a punch with this Ash, whether or not it's downtown arrows uh, or if it's a Varus flashing into arrow. They need to do something to be proactive here. If they just wait and bleed out. Hold on. Actually, you know what? I take that back. Against, jo against what has been the script. Ooh, what happened there? Is Jojo going to call for a pause? Did you see that? That was, a, that was an EQ that he didn't go over. Was he rooted? He might have been rooted. I didn't see fully. We'll have to slow it down and see what happened to him. But uh, I suppose in a world where the scouting report is that Jojo might int, that you could actually not take your shot and just play super steady defensive positioning, make the game as grindy as possible because there's a chance that he might just make a, a blunder for the team. And they get rewarded if, if that's the play style. And honestly, saying it aloud, now it becomes very apparent. Like, yeah, normally it's you got to take your punch. You got to find a way or you're going to bleed out. But when teams aren't playing good macro, which they should be at this level, they should be playing immaculate acro, macro and they should be playing game theory optimal optimized at macro where they have 60% the best game plan, 30% something that's good against the answer to that, and 10% something out of left field to keep people guessing. When you when you're mixing up and you're playing at that level, then yeah, there's there's a certain reciprocation that that is that can or optimal strategies against it. And sometimes you just have to take your punch. But when teams are fumbling, as Cloud9 has you might just say, hey, like, let's just wait for him. He'll int. Let's just wait for that opportunity and go for it. It looks like this is going to be the spot that they're holding for it. Maokai with a beautiful angle on the ultimate. Vulcan's going to try to block as much of this as possible. It is the tankiest Nautilus you've probably seen in recent history. You see where Jojo's standing, right? He's so He wants to outplay them. He's saying, like, look how strong I am. I can even drop soldiers in your face, and there's not much you can do about it. And standing forward, now this is actually this is actually pretty clutch. Standing forward empowers Senna, right? This is something that Senna often finds as a weakness. If you don't have someone willing to stand in front, then the Senna can't do anything. And so by standing in front, you're actually empowering the Senna to be a little bit stronger. You're making that cue a little bit better. I'd love to hear the comms and see if that's really what's going on if they if they are making that and communicating it and effectuating it as they're going using the three steps of the ace program then uh then that's fantastic all right baron is in 240 fifth dragons in 250 15 seconds later so you're gonna have the baron the baron spawning you do not care at all about the dragon here uh, if, if you're fly, you're probably saying we can't even contest for Baron because we're down by so much. We can probably try to stall it by a little bit and try to take the dragon as a consolation prize. The way you would do that is by pushing middle, kind of trying to fight for this kind of contest. Give it up slightly for a moment because you are weaker. Allow the enemy team to come here. Repush the next wave. You can draw wards on this line and then go take this as they're taking the Baron. And perhaps you can, you can, uh, jab at them a little bit with the ash in particular but it's not a mobile champion right so any amount of engage from vulcan is going to uh, put them in a in a tough spot and and right ash being immobile means that all it takes is a spider-man hook from the nautilus and a depth charge or whatever it's called dredge line with dredge line into depth charge to to gap close onto the ash and take that free kill and if they get that then that's going to be game over Top lane's down. Uh, we're going to see Cloud9 fighting for this quadrant right here. Again, fighting for mid prio. Once you get the mid push, you come over, secure vision. Then you can get deep vision as you push again. Then you can start moving in your Renekton in the bot lane. They would love to get this bottom inhibitor down. 
Now, I don't actually like this 4-1 setup. I would prefer a 1-4 with Renekton there in the middle. Because this is the target. The most important target here is the bottom side inhibitor because this will help you secure Baron. Nice big scoop there. Whippo gets taken down even through the edge of night. Interesting interaction there with the Azir versus that. All right, there we go. Nautilus going in. Man, Vulcan is just carrying these fights. You see that? Flashing forward. Put the R on one. The entire team scatters, which means that with their predictable pathing, you, you end up throwing a surprise hook in the opposite direction. You catch the ash. It means two people are dead, and they're just going to walk in the rest of the way. Nautilus does end up trading their life for it, but they should be strong enough here, especially with the Nidalee sieging power. Nidalee giving that extra healing and attack speed to her heal targets. Jojo pressing forward. He's looking for it. Kiting backwards just a bit. You see how Inspired was looking for it? Nice job by Berserker to cleanse right away to make sure that the Malachi can't knock him into the base to take anything further. That's what we like to see. See, that? that's where I want the swagger expression from Jojo is the thumbs up as you're outplaying them to throw the thumbs up. Very nice, nicely done by Cloud9. Uh, that's a fantastic win. Good team win together against the number one team in the league. They can do this. They can do this. They can do this. They can do this, right? They can win this, this league out. They can win out the rest of the games. If they play their style, they should be the best team that has ever played in the LCS and the best team that has ever gone to Worlds. This FlyQuest team is no joke. That's a solid group. And they just, like, dismantled them completely. So we'll see, we'll see what's in store for Cloud9. Thanks again for tuning in, guys. We'll be live again on Monday. You guys can check it out. Uh, yeah, Thursday we're going to be reviewing more LCK games and, and taking uh, viewer requests. So make sure to let us know in the comments what you guys would like to see next, right? Until then, keep, as always, keep it surreal. I'll catch you guys next time. Peace.